So instead of having a traditional uh, panel discussion, what, what we're going to have, and we should get off stage by the way, is a fishbowl instead. So how many of you know what a fishbowl is? Okay, so um, uh, a fishbowl is, uh, we're trying to make it uh, much more interactive than, than uh, uh, a traditional panel discussion. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, Swan and I are going to moderate this sort of like um, a regular panel discussion. But you'll notice we have five chairs over here, but there are only four people sitting in these chairs. The fishbowl basically states that anyone who is currently sitting is allowed to speak, all at the same time, whatever. But like anyone who's currently sitting is allowed to speak. So Swan and I are going to like uh, try to guide the conversation or whatever in general. And whoever sitting here is allowed to answer the questions or put in their thoughts on whatever the points are. Now you as the audience, right? You obviously know much better than these panelists. So uh, you, <laughs> you are going to get your <laughs> I get to speak all the time. This is how this works. <laughs> so, um, so if you as the audience wants to put in your two cents and you want to make your points known, just come up on stage and just sit in the empty chair. The rule is as soon as someone sits in the empty chair, one of you four people have to leave. And what if four of us leave together? <laughs> They'll make you sit. That's what we are here for. <laughs> So one of you have to leave. In case of uh, none of you uh, leaving, we are going to choose. We are going to be the tiebreakers to figure out which one of you we're going to boot off. <laughs> um, uh, can I ask people on, over here to kind of occupy the seats in the middle, please? So um, you can enter the stage from over here. So we expect uh, if people are going to queue up because they really want to say something about this topic, <laughs> this is the area. <laughs> what if the fifth person doesn't come? Don't worry, that's not going to happen. Then, then we, just, we just continue talking in that case. You can continue. You can just come back. <laughs> so, so, so we're going to ask like uh, a couple of questions, and uh, we're going to just see how it goes. All right. Okay. So the very first question we're going to start with is going to be Ruby, because this is a Ruby conference. So I want to ask all the panelists here, what is the one thing that confuses the most about Ruby to you? Or what is one thing that you really dislike about Ruby? We've been he he hearing a lot of good things about Ruby so far. So this is now is the time to speak up uh, something you don't like about Ruby, or, or it's very confusing, what? like you don't know how to use. Or what is the one thing that makes you want to strangle someone every time you see this, uh, every time you see this, and something ideally unique to Ruby? <laughs> Can I go first? Sure, please. So uh, not really specific to Ruby, but ROR, which I'm assuming a lot of people here use. Yep. Uh, I think one of the things that I find uh, early on just find really confusing is you know everything is super easy to do, but uh, you don't realize what queries, uh, DB queries end up happening when you do a very simple you know lookup. Uh, maybe you're just uh, accessing something from a product uh, from a bunch of tables and multiple joins are happening or n plus one queries are happening, and you don't find out about it until you really start digging deep. So everything seems super easy, but to really do it well and to do it right, you need to understand what kind of queries end up happening because of what you're trying to do. Um, so that was like too much magic, I thought. That, too much uh, magic, yeah. Could get Good point. Uh, that's why I like uh, to recommend to people to have all their database queries in their views, because then they're really easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So uh, I'm going to go a little meta on this question and not talk about the Ruby language itself, but I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about uh, more about people and a lot of people in the Ruby community and overall across all communities. There's this habit of you face a problem and you see that there is this one particular gem which is in you know 0.0 0.1 version, but it solves your problem. You just want to go and install it without even looking at the code, without understanding what exactly that gem does, what impact it is going to have on your overall ecosystem when you, know, when you go for upgrade. And this, you have to upgrade every six months. That's like, and gems don't work. You can just not upgrade forever. I mean, that's what I usually do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and if I see those projects, those are the most confusing projects. <laughs> like, if you see a Rails 2.0 project right now, you wouldn't know what to do. 2.0, that feels and like it's the future. And if there is a security <laughs> issue that is fixed, then it, like you'll have to upgrade and then it's tough. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sidhu, it sounds like you want to come up here and say this. Yeah? Uh. Uh, for me, uh, what confuses me most is more than Ruby, it's the Rubyist actually. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. 
it's it's actually like uh, you take one pattern, one person speaking very good about no, that, and then you speak you speak on the same topic. There yeah, would be another person who would be like totally speaking the other way about it. Like Ruby is like not one way to there is like no one right way to do it, and then it's always like many more ways to do. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a first confusion. Yay. So I, I personally dislike it when, so there, there's this really productive part of the Ruby community that writes a lot of gems we all rely on. They're mostly in Seattle. <laughs> and they all use this project management library called Ho. And I just dislike it. Every time they start a new project, like Aaron starts a new project, the first thing I want to do is send him a pull request to remove Ho. All right. Because it's just way too much mod magic for what you could just write in your gem file, uh, your gem spec, sorry. I mean, you just put the whole yeah. gem in the gem file, right? Yeah. Yeah, we could also all just use gist and not GitHub. Um, I usually run into this uh, problem where Someone's worked on a code base, especially in Rails, with all of these super nice, high-level, declarative, extremely expressive uh, APIs without understanding how any of that translates into plain vanilla Ruby. Which, and, and the code that produces is, is really hard to understand because the, whoever wrote it hasn't paid attention to what it's actually doing. Sometimes it's even buggy because you know, I, I mean, the, there is a, a common thing we hear about this, right? Rails programmer, not a Ruby programmer. And I think that Rails programmers easily produce extremely, extremely difficult to understand Ruby code. I want to say I love flip-flops. Does anyone know flip-flops and Ruby? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Everybody they're can. the best thing ever. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, one thing that I'm not sure whether I like, it's not technical, it's a, uh, let's say, culture thing, that if you are not changing everything every other week, then you're just not cool in the Ruby community. So <laughs> I, I don't remember whether, uh, I don't know whether anybody remembers WebRat, which used to be a thing, okay? And then I, I kind of got distracted for uh, like 10 days, then I got back to Ruby, I tried to use WebRat and it's bugged. I mean, it, it's seriously bugged. Something core doesn't work. And I ask on Twitter, and people are like, oh, man, web rat. That's a, you're so last month. Now everybody's <laughs> using Capybara. And th this looks cool to us, but there are people like operations. There are people my age in operations so, who are really uh, rubbed the wrong way by this. So they poke fun at me. Oh, you're doing your Ruby. Yeah, yeah you're young, man. You're a hipster. What did you change tonight? Does it still work this morning? You're like, and uh, I, I'm a bit fed up with that. OK, so maybe okay. playing in, in, oh, sorry, go ahead. So uh, I, I wanted to share this. I've seen most people are uh, getting confused with how scoping work in, works in Ruby. So many people write uh, class method, private class methods in wrong way. Even in today's one of the talk, one of the slides, I have seen uh, they have written uh, private class method under just private, sc uh, that scope. That doesn't make it <coughs> private. So people have to really read about how scoping works in Ruby. All right, okay. Yeah, the, the one thing that is the, the smallest piece of uh, stuff which always bugs me and gets me you know, really pissed off about Ruby is the equality part. You have equal to equal to, you have the case equality operator, you have EQL method, you have EQUAL question mark method. That's, that's crazy for me. Okay, um, one thing which I want to say is I interview people a lot of, and they are Ruby on Rails programmer. And I ask them questions, so are you a Ruby programmer? And they say, no, 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 I'm a Rails programmer. And that <laughs> bugs me like anything. <laughs> uh, okay. Half so, the people are complaining about Rails developers. So, so next question. What I find most annoying on Facebook is people with DSLR cameras, you know, like taking photos of themselves. What I figured out is DSLR stands for DSLs in Ruby. Are this the most annoying thing you've ever seen? DSLs in Ruby. I have another complaint. You cannot leave. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Let's hear it. Um, 
Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? DSLs and Ruby, are they, are they an amazing thing to happen, or are they horrible? Um, no. Any DSL? No, I'm saying RSpec is an amazing thing to it's happen. It's amazing. So, but does it, like, uh, does it hide, like, what's actually happening underneath it? Like, uh, it so, obviously, uh, you cannot say that I'm going to use this DSL, and I'm not going to read about that gem. That was my first complaint, right? <laughs> Whenever you're using a DSL, you have to dig into it. You have to understand how that library is actually working, how that library is actually converting that DSL into runnable code. When you, in RSpec, write it should something, where that it method is coming from, you need to go and dig it. Unless until you dig that, yes, it is annoying. Let, yeah, let's say that for DSL, like anything else, it should be easy to do simple things and possible to do complex things. So if it works the other way around, then it probably sucks. But for example, Rake it works like that, and it's great, because you can use Rake and then go deeper when you need it. Yeah, and one more thing is that DSLs are very opinionated, like the person who is trying to solve a generic problem. Um, it's his point of view. And unless he fails to mature it over the period of time, over the community, then things like folks happen. Like, like I don't want to get into this, but whole puppet shift thing happened because of that. By because way, it was a very open ended DSL. If anyone has anything else to add, don't hesitate. Just yeah, you come, can also just come ask straight questions up. If audience have like questions, can you like, please let me complete? No. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I'm, it's actually interesting that you brought this up because the other thing that really bugs me about DSLs is pretty much all you're doing is depending heavily on that particular specific API, and when the library doesn't respect versioning, I mean it's just appalling. Like. I just did this uh, this uh, coaching session a few months ago, and I was like, well, Rails 4, obviously, we're going to use CanCan. And I hadn't touched Rails in two months, and CanCan can, can was broken. I mean, what? CanCan uh, can, can was broken. That was also broken. Yep. Everything was broken. And uh, I mean, what? And what about CanCan CanCan? The joke, the joke was CanCan can can't. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem with DSL is that uh, when you start designing a DSL, you have to name it properly. And if you actually get it wrong, it can be pretty stupid. You know, when, when it should and it should not, it really doesn't make much sense. Yeah. All right. So the next question. Oh, before you continue, I just realized that it just happened by coincidence. It is the RubyCon organizing team sitting on stage. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> All right. So you're going to move on to the next question. If, uh, the question is, when you're starting on a new Ruby project, What's the one gem that must exist in your gem file, not counting Rails and Bundler? I can tell you what I don't like don't is like. A Rails Bootstrap gem. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I like is RSpec. RSpec. Right. Yeah, yeah, plus one on RSpec. The, the one I don't like and to have is the Ruby Racer. And, <laughs> Ruby and obviously, there, there has to be one of either PG or MySQL or SQLite or Mongoid. Mongoid, Mongoid too. Okay. Yeah. Sell your book, dude. <laughs> yeah, the gem for me I use by default is I could just started, I just end add using a device. But uh, I think Rails, uh, the latest version has got has secure password now, so I don't know if you'll really need it. Okay, so since we have the RubyCon team on stage, let's uh, break you guys up a little bit. Sidhu, can you stay where you are? Ajay, onwards, please. Um, and can I have uh, Lena on stage? <laughs> Ina, please. Uh, maybe uh, Steve and Satish Talim, if he's around. Okay, uh, sorry, Paolo, you want to come on stage? Also, yell at Steve. He didn't actually pay for his conference ticket. I'll, I'll pay later. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. So the next question, actually, we want to put forth to everybody, uh, and not just the panel, is about like building a career in software. Should should you be a general purpose programmer, knowing and your entire stack, or should you be building your career towards focused uh, towards a particular technology or a particular part of the stack? That's the larger question I want to put forth, and I want to hear what everybody, all of you, have to say on this. So remember, these four get the first shot at this question, but everyone else, feel free to come and. Uh, Displace any of them. Yeah, I think these are the kind of things where everybody does have an opinion. So, folks, please come up. <laughs> are you trying to run away from stage? Sorry? Are you trying to, to go away from the stage? Is that self serving? I mean, 
So Steve, you have something to say? Um, sure. So uh, we have a, a few folks in our office actually who um, who don't speak English and who a couple of guys in the office have been teaching English to um, for the past month or two. And uh, conversely, I've been trying to learn Hindi. <laughs> and part of why I haven't learned Hindi in four years of living in India is because it's very painful to go back and be a baby again. And when I'm learning Hindi, I am younger than two years old. Like, I sound completely ridiculous. My accent is wrong. All the letters are wrong. And if you step out of your comfort zone, you are doing exactly that, right? So if I go and try to do operations, I am a two-year-old trying to do operations. So like, oh, I don't know how to set up the diagnostics, and I don't know how to automate this thing. I don't know pretty much everything in the stack, right? Um, but what's fun about that is that when we're teaching the folks in the office English, I can draw comparisons to computer science, right? And as I'm learning Hindi, or at least attempting to learn Hindi, I can draw more comparisons to teaching English and to computer science and to operations and to Ruby and to C and to whatever other um, parts of my job exist. And so I think there's, there's been pushes from both sides to become overall generalists or overall specialists, and I think that they're both wrong, right? Um, and I actually had a mental answer to the very first question, which is what bothers me about the Ruby community. Um, and it's not on the whole, but um, it's something that I, I see in every community a little bit, um, and Ruby more than others sometimes, is that you've stopped learning if there isn't a point where there's no magic, right? So the first time you come to Ruby, Ruby itself is magical. And then when you come to Ruby on Rails, Ruby on Rails is magical. If you feel like you know it all, then you need to go find the thing that's magical and confusing and makes you feel stupid so that you can learn and relearn the things that you already know again, in my opinion. Great point. <laughs> okay. Uh, OK, let's hear someone else. Um, I, I have a more, uh, so this is, this is the question that I got a lot. I was, uh, I was at, at the college I graduated from for the, for the batch, which was starting to do placements. And I got a very specific aspect of this question. Uh, depth versus breadth, right? Do I go really deep down and specialize uh, on, on, in one language even versus breadth? And I think that's a very difficult question to answer because it fundamentally depends on what you want to look, your working life to look like over the next five to 10 years. Because this is not a question that you take lightly. Uh, I think the trade-offs are uh, lie between, say, something like becoming an expert with the JVM or with a particular kind of database. Now, what this means is it puts you in a position where all the hardest problems in the space come to you, because that's why people hire you to, to crack that problem. But you are taking the risk that if something changes in the industry and your area of specialization becomes obsolete overnight, which does happen, you're left high and dry and you're looking at a, a fairly steep learning curve. Um, the other advantage with this is if you're a freelancer, your rates are really good. Because again, I mean, you're, you've got a depth of knowledge which, which very few people have. Uh, but on the flip side, yet again, you're talking about uh, niche, relatively niche skill sets. So you may ha have a hard time finding a suitable role to, to, to uh, you know, that sort of fulfills you in terms of what you want to do. Uh, people who go broad, on the other hand, have, have a different set of advantages and disadvantages. You get a much wider range of work. Uh, the work is likely to be more choppy because you're doing so many different things. So there may be some things you enjoy and don't. But I think it's completely a personal choice as to what you wend, how you wend your way between these two. I don't think anybody else can tell you. Okay, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Not really. Oh, God. Uh, hold the mic closer to your... All right. Is Would somebody else like to come up? Okay. Um, what I... I mean, uh, just do a quick background, okay? I'm actually an SAP professional. I'm an enterprise architect. I work for HP. My primary... It's not at all related to Ruby. But um, the point, uh, the, I'm a software engineer. I mean, I started a software engineer. I'm still a software engineer, even though I'm an enterprise architect. I've been through different roles. And what I have learned, and I've been learning Ruby and Rails and stuff for the past two years as a hobby, and now I'm a lot more interested. But what I have figured out is that um, the question was, you know, whether you need to have depth in one area or just have a broad. 
product classification, what is important? I mean, if you call yourself a software engineer or a developer or a programmer, whatever, the first thing is you're an engineer. I mean, you want to be an engineer. And the point of being an engineer is one, you need to understand how it works. And the first thing you need to know very well before you even go into the depth of a particular language or whatever, you need to get your fundamentals right. And you need to be constantly learning. Like the fundamentals I learned in 98, I'm that old, okay, when I graduated, are very different from now. I mean, we had totally, uh, the paradigms were different. What the paradigms are now are even more, are better, I would say, in some, ex uh, in some areas. But unless the fundamentals are good and proper, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to actually be a good developer, even if just a good programmer. So uh, once you get your fundamentals right, it'll guide you on whether you want to go depth, in depth or broader. Either way, you'll be a good developer. But if your fundamentals are not good, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you could be, you could study and whatever, but somewhere your code will not be proper. Sometimes, somewhere your um, voice is shaking, right? Not really. Uh, some, somewhere your architecture, your, the way you design stuff. I mean, even, if, even as a programmer, the first thing you do as a programmer is you sit and design in your own mind how, how the logic is going to flow, right? And unless your uh, fundamentals are good, and I mean, this is something um, uh, I see when, when we have new staff or we have, we have new hires coming in. If the, if the fundamentals are good, we can do everything else. I mean, your communications, we can improve. Your, everything else we can work on. We can even teach you to code. But the basic software fundamentals, they have to be really good. Like we're talking Ruby, Rails, we're talking, so the fundamentals we're talking are SAS, IAS, FAS. Those need to be very strong. If you understand those well, then you know what, language is just, uh, it's just a matter of a couple of months. Cool. Lina, you had something uh, to uh, say? Yeah. I think it depends. That's the easier answer, right? Uh, both has pros and cons of going into whether, but you need to get some breadth first to go into depth, to understand, okay, to experiment with many things and then go into depth. So I, and I think I completely agree with Stephen what he mentioned earlier. Uh, if you're ready to go out outside your comfort zone, you can always get into breath. Actually, guys, I uh, disagree with hey, you. By the way, I noticed all five chairs are filled, so someone yeah. needs to get up and yeah. leave. All right, actually, I disagree with all of you all to a certain extent. W way to totally ignore what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that again. <laughs> so, uh, knowing that we are at a Ruby conference, I'm assuming everyone here is at least a developer. Are there any managers in the house? Are there any solution architects in the house? <laughs> I actually can't see any hands. Are there any people who really do any work here? <laughs> and when you're actually doing this, you can become a solution architect and you can become a manager only if you actually have the technology depth to get into a technology role. And when you're doing this, as, as early as possible, the deeper you dig into any, to any sort of code actually makes a difference. So whether you are getting to learn Ruby or if you're looking at RSpec, dig as deep. And you can, the, the good part is that we're working on uh, sometimes open source systems. You can dig as deep as you want to learn as much as you can. And it's only in, in going to improve your knowledge. So in my opinion, if you're a developer and you enjoy it, just keep digging deeper. I mean, we, you know, question everything and it'll make you a better, better programmer if that's what you intend to be. If, if you're not a programmer, then you probably shouldn't be sitting here. Yeah, I'll, I'll just take this point forward. That, you know, I got this job because, uh, you know, in one of the best database company in the world was because in the last five years, I have explored or have worked on almost all the web frameworks, mobile frameworks and all. So I'm not a master of all, but, you know, uh, jack, jack of all. But, uh, but what I, I would recommend is you need to be good in uh, one area at least and then you have to spread out and broad base yourself. So if you want to be a solution architect, then you need to broad base. And if you want to be a specialist, then you need to stick. To That's actually completely opposite of what Lena said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I have a different question uh, because yeah, this, this, Go ahead. Been Go ahead. talked about uh, it. Are, are you saying our questions aren't good enough? Is that what <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking a question, okay. So basically, uh, 
uh, when I was uh, starting my last uh, company, uh, that time we chose PHP. I had a lot of prejudice with it, but uh, eventually it worked out very well. Uh, but in Ruby, uh, I'm starting my next company, and the biggest problem I'm facing right now of choosing Rails as the primary technology is uh, basically uh, Ubuntu, it has LTS. It promises something for a longer time. Uh, there is PHP. In PHP, people actually criticize it to the death. I have spoke to a lot of people, uh, and uh, <laughs> I don't like it myself, but it worked for me. But uh, the most important thing is they said that five years will support this framework. In Ruby world, I did not code for three and a half years, and two major language changes happened, and the framework was changed completely. We it move was fast, zero. Man. Now, the thing is, I, I'm not against moving fast. The biggest problem is if I'm basing my next company on it, and I have to actually support that product for four, five years, am I going to rewrite that whole product in uh, twice during that uh, time? Or I'm going to actually start losing gem, like my soldiers on the ground one by one, and these people don't support me at all. So uh, I am always in this perplex situation. Uh, what is the right thing? What people do think about this? Is it really bad to support something for a long time? Or is it just not good enough to support something for a long time? OK, and let's I think we're coming to the last five minutes. So let's just keep all our statements so quick. In, in one word, it's evolution, right? Everything changes. And one of the keywords in Ruby is always called refactoring. You always end up refactoring. What we actually miss out on is in production environment, you need to have the, I wanted to say the right word. You know, it's a round spherical thing. You need to have the guts to actually say that, you know what, I am going to upgrade my systems. <laughs> I am going to do this whether if you're your own product, you should upgrade to the latest version. You should take, a, take the leap of faith. Don't, and if you're, a, faith if you're in the, the services, most important word I'm getting at. If you're in the services company, it's a big issue. I know there are a lot of people who work in services companies here. Customer did not allow me. We've actually got but a, That is more like an excuse. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We actually have an unwritten rule. Don't tell the customer, just create a GitHub branch, upgrade it. Make sure it works. Make sure text passes. You have, you have good co you know, code quality. And just run with it. You it just works. You didn't, yeah, you didn't ask the customer when you shut around with Rails. So why should I ask you when, when you have to upgrade? So. Cool. I, I have two things to say here. So one is something related to the current discussion, which is uh, uh, instead of putting it as an issue, it is something which keeps you going. So which keeps your meter running, because the customer always needs you. Dependency doesn't go. So that is one way of putting it. So people in Rails do make money because of that. Anyway, uh, coming to the original question, uh, I have uh, one more angle to the whole thing, uh, which would be it depends on how comfortable a person is in adapting to new things and picking up new skills and learning. Okay, so if if somebody is really good, I myself have worked over different uh, domains and verticals altogether. Okay, I was in infrastructure space and now I'm a solution architect and blah, blah, blah. I'm comfortable picking up things, okay, so where a full stack programmer, uh, programmer, I mean, uh, diversified uh, skill set, everything works, yes. If you find picking up new things, working outside the comfort zone, everything takes time, I would say stick to the particular thing what you're doing, do it good, it'll be helpful. So we're open to audience QA now. Anybody has any questions? We're gonna just take one question for the audience, again, like whatever, whatever you guys want, just. Anything. Uh, Anyone, raise their hand. Got them. <laughs> uh, what after Ruby? What language? If you had a choice, what would you choose? Uh, so the question is, uh, what's next after Ruby? If you had uh, a choice, what would you choose next? Functional stuff. Functional, yeah. Functional. Whatever pays my bills. Which one? Functional. I would go with anything which makes money, if I have to do that, after Rails. Yes. I like the way you say it. I like we finally have one honest <laughs> panelist on this. I got a solution Yes. You, you keep talking about solution architects. I don't exactly know what that is. Uh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it sounds like fun because everybody's laughing, but uh, what the heck is that? <laughs> uh, that was too tempting, man. Uh, a solution architect, pardon the, if anybody has that title in your company, I'm really sorry about it. But in my opinion, <laughs> my opinion, a solution architect is a person who comes there, 
Uh, how many of y'all have seen MasterChef? Yeah. Right? MasterChef Australia? It's like, hmm, I think the consistency uh, you know, of this, uh, the, the database is not right. <laughs> I think the scalability in this syrup is pretty cool. I haven't fucking gone and made anything. <laughs> I have just tasted it, but I have given an opinion. <laughs> okay, so that is a solution architect of bigger companies, typical big companies, groups. Solution architect for smaller uh, startups and growing companies are much different. I'm guessing it's you have one. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing without the scale, really. <laughs> so, uh, the bigger companies, yes, what you said makes a lot of sense there. But uh, startups and growing companies, it's more like where you need to be hands-on, you need to have depth, okay. Any other questions? I, th I, think, I think we're out of time. I think we're out of time. So on that happy note, we're going to uh, uh, move over to the keynote. Uh, Sidhu and Aranjan, do you guys want to?